Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks. So I will. Um, yeah. So I will get started with the second uh, lecture. So let me just share the screen. Um, okay, so all right, so the goal of um, so in today's lecture, we're, I just want to sort of continue with the, the general algebraic theory of quadratic forms over fields, fields of characteristic not two, um, and sort of isomorphisms between them. And we're, you know, we're going to use some of these tools later in the, in the course to study invariance of uh, quadratic forms on the Hassan Minkowski theorem. Um, and so what I want to start off today with uh, is the following uh, sort of really fundamental theorem uh, due to Witt. Uh, and so the theorem is the following, right? So I guess I should say, well, throughout the lecture, we're going to fix a field F uh, where the characteristic is not equal to two. Uh, okay, so the theorem is the following. So let V comma W comma Z be quadratic forms. Uh, over f. Uh, sorry, so this theorem is due to fit. Uh, it's called the cancellation theorem. It's cancellation theorem. Uh, and the theorem is that, well, let's suppose that v direct sum z is isomorphic to w direct sum z, so as quadratic spaces. Uh, and then the conclusion uh, is that v is just isomorphic to w. Um, so it's saying that you can you can sort of cancel isomorphisms. Um, so if, if if two things become isomorphic after you add a, the same sum end, then they're actually isomorphic to begin with. Um, and this is the type of um, result which is generally not true. Like you know, in in there are lots of mathematical objects where you can do this kind of thing. You know, you want to study whether a and b are isomorphic. And there's a weaker question, which is, well, what happens if A plus C is isomorphic to B plus C? So that's some sort of stabilized isomorphism question. And usually the stabilized isomorphism question for various reasons is a lot easier to understand. And stabilized isomorphism classes um, of most types of mathematical objects are, are much easier to understand than isomorphism classes. Um, and so then this theorem is kind of remarkable, which is saying that in the setting of quadratic forms, um, there's sort of no difference between these two concepts. Um, right. And so, so just also a caveat is that um, when I say isomorphic, I mean there exists an isomorphism. So that the isomorphisms that you have here are not necessarily going to be related. They're, well, generally, they're not going to be related. Um, right. So, so what sort of special, you know, so what makes this work for quadratic forms that doesn't work for, you know, for other classes of mathematical objects? Um, it's that quadratic forms, or as as mentioned last time, they a key feature of quadratic forms is that they they have lots of symmetries. Um, so with that in mind, let's um, let's prove the theorem. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, so Z is diagonalizable, so as we saw last time. And hence, it's a sum of one-dimensional forms. Uh, so by induction, well, by index, induction on the dimension of Z, we can assume that Z itself is one-dimensional. So we can assume Z is the one-dimensional form brackets A. So in other words, spanned by a vector whose uh, dot product with itself is equal to A. So suppose uh, we're given an isomorphism um, from a V direct sum brackets A. Uh, so let's call this isomorphism T to W direct sum brackets A. Um, and what we want to do is we want to cook up an isomorphism from V to W. Um, so to do this, let me let me give these uh, vectors names. So let's let's say e1 is a basis element uh, in brackets a over here, and f1 is um, the basis element in brackets a over here. So the basic problem is that uh, so in general, t is some isomorphism like this, and in general, it's not true that t of e1 is equal to f1. So if t of e1 were equal to f1, then you could say, well, you've got an isomorphism that takes E1 to F1, and therefore it takes the orthogonal complement of E1 to the orthogonal complement of F1. And that would just be saying that T carries V into W. So if T of E1 
equals f1, or in fact, you don't even need t of e1 to be equal to f1. For example, it could be minus f1 for this argument to work. Um, then t uh, carries uh, v, which is so, which is e1. Sorry, e1 perp into w, which is f1 perp, and induces the isomorphism we want. Um, so the problem is that t, you have some isomorphism, but it doesn't necessarily direct, uh, respect the direct sum decomposition. So it doesn't have to carry e1 into f1. So, so that's, that's, that's well, in general, in this type of thing, that's, that's why stable isomorphism is going to be uh, a weaker relation than isomorphism. Um, but so what sort of saves us in this, in this quadratic form setting is, is that you have lots of isomorphisms. And even though t of e1 is not equal to f1, what you can always do is you can pre-compose or post-compose with some other automorphism uh, to, make this, to make this happen. So what you can do is that observe now that t of e1 and f1, so we can think of those as vectors. They live in the vector space w direct sum brackets a, and this is times f1. Um, are uh, two vectors of the same length or of the same length squared. Um, and now there's this uh, this wonderful uh, lemma that uh, well I guess it was it was in the exercises from last time, but I I, I want to sort of state it over here. Um, which is that, so whenever you have two vectors with this property, two vectors in a quadratic space, such that they have the same length squared, the same self dot product, um, then they're carried, there, there's an automorphism of that quadratic space that carries um, one to another. So, um, so let me state this as a proposition. I'll prove the proposition, but first I will explain how the proposition applies to theorem. So proposition is that if, uh, um, so if V comma Q is any quadratic space, uh, then the orthogonal group O of V comma Q acts transitively on the set of all vectors V and V such that V dot V is equal to A for any A not zero. Uh, in the field F. So, so you have lots of you have lots of symmetries of any quadratic space. In fact, you can go from I mean, sorry. So, I mean, the basic example of this is if you have like the Euclidean space, and then this is saying that the orthogonal group of the Euclidean space is going to act transitively on the n minus one sphere. Um, so, this is a generalization of that to any quadratic space. Um, so, I mean, I'll prove the proposition in a second, but now let me explain why uh, the theorem follows. So, apply. Oops, so, apply the proposition. to the vector space V, uh, sorry, not to W direct sum brackets A to obtain an automorphism U, which lives in the orthogonal group of W direct sum brackets A, such that U of T of E1 is equal to F1. And then you observe that U composed with T is an isomorphism from V direct sum brackets A to W direct sum brackets A, which carries E1 into F1 and hence induces an isomorphism from V into W. So that's that proves the theorem. Okay. So once you have enough automorphisms to act transitively on these sort of generalized spheres, then that proves the result. Okay, so now let me explain the proof of this proposition. So this, again, this was on the, um, the exercises for, uh, for yesterday. Um, and the idea is that you're going to use a reflection. The idea is that you're going to, you're going to use a suitable reflection um, to go between any two vectors, except you might have to multiply by plus or minus one as well. So proof, let's suppose I have two vectors. So suppose V comma W are, are vectors in this quadratic space such that V dot V is equal to W dot W, which is equal to A, and A is some element of my um, 
my ground field, which is not zero. And so what we want is uh, some, some element T in the orthogonal group uh, of this quadratic space, uh, such that T of V is equal to W. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to consider the reflection uh, reflections through V plus or minus W. So consider the following two vectors. So consider V dot, sorry, consider the vectors uh, V plus or minus W. Um, and the, the observation is that because V dot V is equal to W dot W, we have that these two vectors are orthogonal. So V plus W uh, dot with V minus W is equal to zero. So V plus W is orthogonal to V minus W. Um, and uh, as a consequence, either, well, if you have two orthogonal vectors and they're both isotropic, then their sum is also isotropic. So, um, so as a consequence, either V plus W or V minus W uh, must be anisotropic uh, because if, uh, if they were both isotropic, then V itself would be isotropic or two V would be isotropic, which, um, and let me suppose for simplicity, that V minus W is anisotropic. Um, so I'll explain how to handle the other case. So then consider the reflection uh, through the vector V minus W. So you're allowed to reflect, well, so you're allowed to reflect through any vector which is anisotropic. So it has to be anisotropic because you're dividing by that vector dotted with itself. And observe that this reflection through V minus W will sort of by construction carries V minus W to W minus V. Um, so it's the identity on the line through V minus W. Oh, sorry, it's minus one on the line through V minus W. And it's the identity on the orthogonal complement. So it carries W, uh, it carries V plus W to V plus W. Um, and hence it carries um, v into W as desired. So, so this works. So this reflection works great. So I could have even just started with this comment. So if if v minus W is anisotropic, so, um, then you just take the reflection through it, and then then you have your diagonal transformation. Um, if if not, you have to work a little bit harder. But if v minus W is anisotropic, is isotropic, then v plus W is anisotropic. So if V minus W is isotropic, then V plus W is anisotropic. And you compose the reflection with a minus one. So if you reflect through V plus W, then you have to add an extra sign at the end, but that's fine because the sign is also in your orthogonal group. It's multiplying by a scale. Okay, so that's the proof of the proposition. And then that, which, which is telling you that you, ha you have this transitive action. And then that's also the proof of, um, of its cancellation theorem. Okay, so, so if its cancellation theorem um, and also um, a sequel, which I'll explain a little bit later, um, is a really powerful tool for trying to understand isomorphism classes of quadratic forms. And it helps, um, and in particular, one of the key features that it has is that it lets you write quadratic forms in sort of a, a normal form. Um, so, um, right. So Witt's theorem is fundamental because it um, enables one to write quadratic forms in sort of a normal form. Um, and it also means that, uh, so in general, like, uh, so as I mentioned, sort of studying stable isomorphism classes of objects, when you consider isomorphisms after you've added or direct summed on some other, other term, is a lot easier. 
And that's because stable isomorphism classes of, of objects can often be organized into abelian groups. I mean, this is sort of the starting point of, uh, of, of, of K theory or K zero. Um, and in the case of quadratic forms, this leads to a structure called the Grodendieck fit ring, which is gonna come up next time. Um, and so this is sort of like just, it's a commutative ring. You can write it down and you can study it in various ways. And what that's saying is that, well, what that cancellation is saying is that you can actually encode the isomorphism class of quadratic forms um, uh, through it, through the stable isomorphism class. Okay, so, so we're gonna come back to that. Um, but also, sorry, first, before I wanna move on, I just also wanna say uh, just a comment about the exercises. So I, I have to apologize. So in, um, so in, in the exercises for yesterday, um, so you proved, um, uh, you proved this proposition and I also asked uh, you to prove um, the carton dudonet theorem, which, uh, which is that any, uh, any element of the orthogonal group uh, is a product of at most n reflections, where n is the dimension. Um, and um, so, well, you should, you should have to try it. That's, that's a theorem, and um, uh, it's, 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 um, it's completely true. Uh, but it is a little bit harder than what I intended to ask, which is really just that it's generated by reflections. Um, and so, um, so the fact that it's generated by reflections is something that um, really you can prove directly from this proposition. There's, there's some more, there's a slightly more elaborate argument to, to, to show that you can take out most n reflections. So, so there's gonna be a, in, in, the, in today's, um, today's exercise set, which is already posted in Sococo, um, it sort of walks you through the argument to prove the stronger form of Cartan to Um Though in fact, that's, the precise quantitative form is actually not going to be used later, but um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now I want to move on with the general theory of quadratic forms. Um, and in particular, I want to explain sort of a particularly fundamental example of a quadratic form, which we sort of saw yet, uh, yesterday, but which is really central to a theory, uh, and that's a hyperbolic plane. So hyperbolic forms. So the hyperbolic plane is the following quadratic form. So it's a quadratic, well, I'm just gonna specify by a symmetric matrix and it's a symmetric matrix zero, one, one, zero. Um, so it's, it's this two dimensional quadratic form. Um, and while well, you can think of it as follows, it has a basis, uh, so it, it's two dimensional, it has a basis given by vectors E1, E2, which are isotropic. And such that E1 dot E2 is equal to one. Um, and by the way, E1 dot E2 equals one. You can replace one by any other scalar, any other non-zero scalar. So just rescale E1 or E2 appropriately. Um, but the key point is that it's generated by two isotropic vectors that are, um, that have a non-trivial inner product with respect to each other. Um, yeah, so by the way, you can also write this as uh, a quadratic form one, zero, zero, minus one. It's a quadratic form x squared minus y squared. Um, okay, so, um, so this is a hyperbolic plane and uh, the basic, uh, right, so, so the, one of the basic reasons this is so fundamental um, is, is the following proposition. Uh, so if V is any, uh, any quadratic form um, over F, which is, which is isotropic, so let V be isotropic quadratic form, uh, then what you can always do is you can always split off a copy of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, so, um, so then V is, V is isomorphic to a hyperbolic plane direct sum V prime for some smaller quadratic form V prime. Well, I guess I should give the hyperbolic plane a name. I'll call it H2. So whenever you have an isotropic form, you can always split off a copy of, of the hyperbolic plane and some smaller form. Um, and in fact, so by the Witt cancellation theorem, this V prime is actually determined up to isomorphism. 
So what's the proof? Uh, for certain, uh, whenever uh, we talk about prophetic form, we mean uh, we uh, assume it to be uh, non-degenerated, right? By form. Yes, every, sorry, thank you. Uh, yeah, so when I say quadratic forms, I'm only going to consider non-degenerate quadratic forms. Yeah, thanks. And, and yeah, also the field is characteristic, not, not two. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, right, so, so how do we prove this? Well, um, right, so, so if, if V is a uh, quadratic form, we can let little v, so let lowercase v, v be an isotropic vector. Well, isotropic and non-zero. Um, and then we're just gonna sort of build a hyperbolic plane sitting inside V. Um, so, well, so by assumption our quadratic form is non-degenerate, so we can find uh, a vector W in V such that W dotted with V is not zero. And then basically you just sort of have to normalize it. So then basically V and W are gonna span a hyperbolic plane um, and well, so, so W doesn't have to be isotropic, but basically you replace W uh, with W minus lambda V for some lambda in, um, in the field F. Um, so if, if, if you just make some shearing automorphism, then, then, then you, can, um, you can normalize so that you have two isotropic vectors such that their inner product is not zero, and then you've got a hyperbolic plane. Um, so this gives a hyperbolic plane sitting inside V, and then you can take V prime to be the orthogonal complement. So there, so, so that's pretty. Right. So, um, so this is really useful because it's saying, right, so it's saying that whenever you have an isotropic form, so I mean, the standard example of an isotropic form is just a hyperbolic plane, and it's saying that whenever you have an isotropic form, you can always sort of peel off a copy of the hyperbolic plane and you're left with something smaller. And in fact, you can, you can just keep doing this. You can keep doing this. You can just keep peeling off uh, copies of the hyperbolic plane until you're left with something anisotropic, something with no non-trivial zeros, um, and that's actually, well, by again, by VIT cancellation, it's going to be determined up to isomorphism. So a corollary is that any quadratic form is going to be isomorphic to a cop some, some direct sum of copies of the hyperbolic plane plus some other quadratic form V prime Q prime, where V prime Q prime is anisotropic and it's determined up to isomorphism. So again, by bit cancellation, it's determined up to isomorphism. Um, so if you want to classify quadratic forms up to isomorphism over any field, um, then it really suffices to classify the anisotropic quadratic forms because every quadratic form is some some, cop, some direct sum of copies of the hyperbolic plane plus something anisotropic. Um, sorry, so I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, sorry, so the question is what is an isotropic form? An isotropic form means a, a form that has a, a vector with zero, zero length. So um, yeah, so let me just write that. So recall, V is if there exists some element of V, some vector, some non-zero vector with V dot V equals zero, and it's anisotropic otherwise. So if, if your goal is to classify quadratic forms up to isomorphism, which is, um, which is an important goal in the subject, um, then it really suffices to, um, to work with anisotropic forms. I mean, another observation is that basically um, like hyperbolic forms look the same over any field and sort of any question involving them is very easy to answer. Um, so it's, it's really the anisotropic forms that have the, that are sort of interesting to understand. Um, 
Okay, so this is sort of the normal form of quadratic forms that I was alluding to, that, that uh, you can always, yeah, that, that anisotropic forms are the building blocks and the ones that you want to sort of understand uh, up to isomorphism. Um, so yeah, so another sort of observation um, um, that's really a consequence of um, Vett's cancellation theorem in this type of machinery is um, so it's just sort of a general observation in the theory of quadratic forms. So as I mentioned, like if, if you're studying quadratic forms, there are sort of at least three natural questions that you can ask if quadratic forms over a given field. Um, so the first question is, um, you know, so when if I have two quadratic forms, when are they isomorphic? What can I do to distinguish them or see if they're isomorphic? Um, the second question is, when does a quadratic form represent zero? So when is a quadratic form anisotropic? And the third question is, when do when does a quadratic form represent an element of the field? So when is there a vector v with v dot v equal to some element of the field? And it turns out that really the most powerful question in all of this is the question of when is a quadratic form isotropic? So the really fundamental question um, that you can ask over a given field is to, is to have a tool for determining when a quadratic form is isotropic. Um, and so for example, this is the form that the, um, the hassan minkowski uh, theorem states. So the fundamental question Well, sorry, when I say fundamental question, I mean fundamental out of the three questions I mentioned. Um, um, okay, so, um, so I guess what I mean by that is that suppose you have like an oracle, you have an oracle that will tell you, so you, you're working over some field and you have, you have an oracle that will tell you when a given quadratic form is isotropic. You, you hand it a quadratic form and the oracle tells you whether or not it's isotropic then you can classify quadratic forms over the field, sort of inductively, at least. Um, so in particular, sorry, so when I say it's a, the quote unquote fundamental question, I mean that this is a stronger question. Okay, so, so why is this really the fundamental question? So suppose B comma Q, well, suppose you have some sort of oracle or machine that will tell you when quadratic forms are isotropic. And now let's suppose that B comma Q and W comma Q prime are quadratic forms. And you wanna know if they're isomorphic. So how do you do this? Well, first you have your oracle, so you can ask are V and W uh, isotropic or anisotropic? So if V and W are isotropic, then write them in the normal form. So they're hyperbolic planes plus anisotropic. And now if V and W are isomorphic, then the anisotropic parts are isomorphic and the number of hyperbolic sum ends have to be isomorphic. So, uh, so V is isomorphic to W if and only if the anisotropic parts are isomorphic and the number of hyperbolic planes, well, okay, so I guess you know the dimensions. So if the anisotropic parts are isomorphic, then they have to be isomorphic because hyperbolic parts have the same dimension. Um, so, so you may as well assume that V and W are anisotropic if you want to have some sort of machine for determining when they're isomorphic. And now there's this nice sort of trick. Well, if you want V to be isomorphic to W, then any length squared in V, so any, any, any scalar that's represented by V has to be represented by W as well. So pick V and V and let 
a to be little v dot v. By construction, uh, v direct sum minus a is isotropic. So, so question, is w direct sum minus a isotropic? So if not, then v is not isomorphic to w. Oh, clearly. Uh, but if yes, what you do is you split off hyperbolic planes from v direct sum minus a and w direct sum minus a and ask if they're isomorphic uh, and ask if the complements are isomorphic. And this is actually a, well, and, and then you sort of recursively continue this, this process. And this terminates because at each stage you're lowering the dimension. I mean, this is, the complements are going to be dimension less than, less than V. So inductively determines, determines when V and W are isomorphic. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe I won't spend too much time on this, but I think that the rough takeaway is that really the, the most powerful question in this business is, is whether you can tell uh, when a quadratic form is isotropic. Um, and sometimes there are, there are a bunch of results. Um, so for example, like it's often easier to prove that quadratic forms are isomorphic uh, or to have a tool from showing that they're isomorphic than to, to prove whether a quadratic form is isotropic. And so often there are sort of two different forms of various results. And, the, the version involving when you can solve the equation when something is isotropic is it's usually a strictly stronger statement. Um, and that's because of this, this type of um, um, procedure. Okay, so sorry, so there's a question. Um, what does it say between inductively and when? Um, right, sorry. So it's saying you want to understand when V is isomorphic to W and well, V is isomorphic to W, if V is isomorphic to W, well, then V direct sum minus A is isotropic if and only if W direct sum minus A is isotropic. And then if and only if the anisotropic parts of V direct sum minus A and W direct sum minus A are isomorphic. So you sort of reduce your question of when are two anisotropic forms isomorphic to a question about anisotropic forms in smaller dimension um, using this sort of procedure. Okay. What does it say uh, after if and below? So if not. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so maybe instead of, well, maybe I can put this on the problem set or something to think about it more, but I, I really just want to work through it in. I mean, we're really just going to want to work through this in an example um, and just really see how, how this sort of helps us. And the goal, I just want to be really concrete here. The goal is let's classify quadratic forms over a finite field. So, um, so maybe rather than trying to you know, make this very precise and we can ask like, what, what, what do we really mean by an algorithm and so forth? Um, I just want to sort of illustrate this by saying, well, let's, let's classify quadratic forms over a finite field. So application, well, maybe application of this idea Let's classify quadratic forms over F over a finite field FQ. So we saw last time that you can classify quadratic forms over C, they all look the same at the given dimension, over R, where well basically have the dimension and the signature. And so now we want to do the the, the other sort of case that's that's simplest, which is the case of a finite field. Um but I think it'll be sort of maybe fun and also relevant to point out that this, these methods are actually more general than the case of a finite field. Um, so they will apply in some other examples, which maybe will not be used in the course, but are uh, quite interesting. Um, and uh, well, more so, so I'm actually gonna try to formulate this a little bit more generally. So 
what we're going to do is we're going to, well, going to make the following definition, which is, uh, so given a field F, the U invariant of F uh, is a dimension, right? It's the largest dimension of an anisotropic form over F or infinity if, if there's, no, um, there's no largest dimension. So for example, if you're over the real numbers, then the U invariant is infinity because X one squared plus dot 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 plus X a million squared is still anisotropic. Um, but over many fields, once you have a quadratic form in enough variables, it, it automatically has a solution. Um, and that's called, that's called the U invariant. And so what we'll be interested in is, so, so the U invariant is, I guess it's some sort of measure um, of the complexity of some form, at least as far as quadratic forms are concerned of a field. Um, because if, you, if your U invariant is small, then basically the classification of quadratic forms is somehow reduced to the classification in small dimensions because, because once the dimension gets large enough, then you can sort of keep splitting off um, hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic forms. So roughly, the smaller the U invariant, the easier it is to classify quadratic forms. Um, and I think I put some stuff on about the U invariant on the uh, on the exercises. The U invariant is actually um, is actually connected to uh, quite a bit of recent research in the um, you know, in the, in, in the theory of quadratic forms. Um, there are a lot of sort of open questions involving, involving the U invariant. And what we're not really gonna need most of, what well, we're not gonna touch that, but uh, what I wanna do is, 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 is to sort of, I mean, just use this as like, sort of a guide. I mean, if the U invariant is small, then it's easier to classify quadratic forms. Um, well, roughly because if you can show that lots of things are isotropic, then it's easier to classify quadratic forms. Um, and uh, in particular, I want to start with the following theorem, which is that uh, any quadratic form of dimension three, or dimension at least three, over FQ is isotropic. So the U invariant. Uh, is is equal to two. Okay, so you have to check something, which is that there is a binary anisotropic form, but, uh, well, okay, so, uh, I can come back to that. But in particular, once you have at least three variables, there's a root. So once you have at least three variables in a quadratic form over, over a finite field, um, there's always a solution. So this is a basic fact, which is, kind of why, well, it's gonna tell us that the, the classification of quadratic forms is also sort of very simple uh, over a finite field. And in fact, this classification is gonna work over any field where the U invariant is equal to three, uh, sorry, equal to two. Okay, so let me prove this theorem. Let me prove that any quadratic form of dimension three over FQ is isotropic. Um, and uh, well, we can always diagonalize our quadratic form. So we can assume the form uh, is brackets a comma b comma c, where we have some non-zero elements of uh, the field FQ. Uh, and so what we want is a non-zero solution to the equation uh, ax squared plus by squared plus CZ squared equals zero. So what we want is, an, uh, is a root of this quadratic form, so an isotropic vector. Um, and that means we want a non-trivial solution of the equation AX squared plus CY squared, plus BY squared plus CZ squared is equal to zero. Okay, so, um, right. So in fact, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take Z equals one, 
uh, so that that what we want to solve is ax squared equals uh, minus c minus by squared. Uh, and now we're just going to make a counting argument. Uh, so now we're going to make a counting argument. Well, we observe that the left-hand side only depends on x and the right-hand side only depends on y. So we have a function of x and a function of y. And we just want to show that their ranges overlap. So left-hand side depends only on x. Right-hand side depends on y. And we want to show that the two functions have ranges that overlap. So observe that if you look at the collection of all numbers, all numbers in FQ of the form AX squared as X ranges over FQ, this set has cardinality uh, Q plus one divided by two. So why is that? Well, you first let X range over all the units in FQ and uh, then squaring is two to one on the units of FQ. So AX squared is X ranges over the units. It, it's gonna have size Q minus one over two. Um, but then you also have zero, and so then that adds one. And similarly, the collection of all minus c minus b y squared as y ranges over f q has size q plus one over two. Um, and so that means there has to be an overlap because you have two subsets of f q that each of which is greater than, I mean, so so, th so they can't be disjoint because otherwise they we have more than you know, pigeonhole principle. So by the pigeonhole principle, um, you can solve the equation. Uh, and that's a proof. And so that, that tells you that you can, you, can find, um, you can find an isotropic vector in your three-dimensional quadratic, um, quadratic space. Um, yeah, so this is kind of a fun uh, argument. So in it's fact, there's a... Um, sorry. sorry, doesn't that show that the U invariant is at least two? That doesn't prove it's explicitly that you can't have an anisotropic form of um, higher degree, does it? Um, okay, yeah, thanks. That's, uh, yeah, so I, I, I should, you're right, I, I should say a little bit more. So, oh, right, so, so first that, of all, that has degree three. Couldn't we have that the highest degree of an anisotropic form is one? Right, so I, I should, I should uh, you're right, so. Um, that's the, that you can construct one that is, uh, that is anisotropic for the degree two or something, right? Right, so you can do that because not every element of, um, of FQ is a square. So let, uh, you, well, maybe I shouldn't call it U. <laughs> let V be an element of FQ cross, which is not a square. So then, x squared plus v, uh, sorry, x squared minus v y squared equals zero has no has no solution. Q equals two. I'm always I'm only working in in odd in characteristic greater than two. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so. Right, so not every element is a square. So you can write down a binary quadratic form that doesn't have any solutions. Um, so the U invariant is at least two. Um, but if you have a quadratic form in you know, five variables, then it has a subform of three variables. Um, and so, so then, then you get an isotropic factor. So yeah, so th yeah thanks for putting that out. Uh, okay, sorry, there's a question. All right, so why is the size? Okay, so why is the size of ax squared, the, the collection of all ax squared as x ranges over fq, um, why, is that, why is that size exactly q plus one over two? Well, let's, let's count. So first of all, let's count the cases where x is not zero. So if x is not zero, then the function of squaring is exactly two to one. I, I mean, the pre-image of everything in the image is exactly two points, you know, plus or minus. Um, so, so the non-zero squares are, are cardinality q minus one over two, um, and then you have zero. And so if, if, if you add both of those, then you get q plus one over two. Uh, 
Yeah, so. Um, and so, yeah, so then that also applies to the other um, case. Okay. Um, right, so, yeah, so also uh, I'll stick around after the, I, I, sorry, please ask questions now as well, but I, I will also stick around after, uh, after this. Um, okay, so there's actually a more general, so this, this is sort of a fun and um, direct argument, but it, it did use a diagonalization of quadratic forms, so it doesn't necessarily apply if you have forms of higher degree, but there's actually a wonderful result uh, that there's something like this in, for higher degree polynomial equations as well. Um, and so this is something that you'll explore a little bit on the exercises, which is that, uh, so, so more generally, uh, finite fields, uh, are what's called C1, meaning if you have a homogeneous polynomial, so if you have a homogeneous polynomial P of X1 through Xn uh, is homogeneous of degree D in N variables, uh, and N is greater than D, so there, there are more variables than uh, the degree, uh, then, then there's a non-trivial zero. So there's a, there's a, a zero of this polynomial, which is not just a zero vector. So there's a non-trivial zero um, in, in, in the finite field. Um, so any field that has this property is called, uh, called C1. Um, and so actually I think, uh, so, uh, another example, I mean, there are other examples of, so, so in particular, C1 field is something that has this property that uh, any like ternary quadratic form is, is isotropic. Um, and there, there are many other important examples of C1 fields. So, so a little bit on, um, on the problem set. So, so something like uh, um, the rational function field uh, of uh, uh, the field of rational functions in one variable over, over the complex numbers. Um, and yeah, so, Okay, so these are, these are sort of particularly simple fields for many of these types of like cohomological and arithmetic questions of finding solutions to equations. Um, right, sorry, so there's a question of why is it C1 and what's the one? Uh, well, there's a version of this for, there's, there's, a, there's a notion of CR field, yes. Uh, yeah, so it's answered in the chat where, where you have, um, well, instead of saying that you have more variables than D, we replace that by D to the K, so. So you need an even larger, there are weaker conditions where you need even more variables to have, have a root. Um, okay. Yeah, so, so for example, FQ is, uh, is C1, but something like a Laurent series field, FQ Laurent series T is gonna be C2. So, yeah, so there, there is sort of this sort of a hierarchy of fields that and as it goes up, it becomes sort of harder and harder to solve the equations over them. So I just have a few minutes. So what I want to do is I want to explain how you can get the classification of quadratic forms over, over a finite field or more generally over any field um, of um, where the U invariant is, is at most two. So where the ternary forms are right, isotropic. So now let's classify quadratic forms over FQ or really over any field of U invariant uh, at most two. Um, right. Um, so, yeah. So for example, this will apply to any C1 field. Um, so if you have a quadratic form and you want to understand what it is up to isomorphism, then, well, the first invariant is the dimension, uh, which works over any field. Um, but there's, uh, there's an, another invariant that you can write down pretty easily, which is called a discriminant. So let's make the following definition. So let V comma Q be a quadratic form. And this is gonna work over any field F. Um, so uh, the discriminant uh, is defined, well, first you choose a basis, 
So choose, choose a basis EI uh, of V and the discriminant of V comma Q is exactly the determinant of EI dotted with EJ. So you choose a basis and then you get a symmetric matrix, right? So, so as last time a quadratic form is given by, can be specified if you've chosen a basis, the inner product is specified by some symmetric, um, uh, some symmetric n by n symmetric non-singular matrix. And so you can take the determinant and that's the discriminant. But the caveat is that, well, right now, so this is not really well-defined because, uh, well, for example, if you scale the basis, if you just scale all the basis vectors by, um, by five, then, um, um, then you're, gonna, you're, you're gonna scale this. Um, so, right. Or, well, yeah, sorry. So I guess what you should do is you should consider this as living in F cross modulo F cross squared. So it's gonna be indeterminate, it's gonna be independent of the choice of basis. Um, if, you, uh, uh, if you make this live in F cross modulo F cross squared, uh, and that's, that's basically because, I mean, if you think about how the symmetric matrix is determined, so, so any quadratic form gives you a symmetric matrix. And when you change a basis, then you multiply the symmetric matrix by some matrix on the left and by its transpose on the right. And so if you think about what that's doing to the determinant, it doesn't fix the determinant, but it multiplies the determinant by a square. So this determinant is, is not something that's, that's um, independent of the choice of basis, but if you change the choice of basis, you will always change this determinant by a square. Um, so you get a well-defined cosine in F cross mod F cross square. Um, and uh, right, so for example, if F equals, So if F equals FQ, then FQ cross mod FQ cross squared is Z mod two. Um, so you'll get a, if you consider the discriminant of a quadratic form over, over a finite field, you'll, you'll just get a sign plus or minus one. Okay. And so, yeah, so let me state the proposition. Proposition over a field of U invariant at most two. So I, every ternary form is isotropic. Then quadratic forms are classified uh, by the, uh, the dimension which is uh, which is a positive integer, um, not negative integer, and uh, and the discriminant. Okay, so that's the that's the theorem. So what's, what's the proof of this? Um, right. So I guess basically the proof is that um, if you wanna classify quadratic forms, then you may as well classify quadratic forms of dimension at most two, because if you have a quadratic form of dimension greater than two, then you can split off a bunch of hyperbolic pieces. And well, if you do that, you'll change the discriminant, well, to change the dimension by multiplying, by subtracting some even integer, and you'll change the discriminant by a sign. Um, so without loss of generality, you can assume uh, that you're working in dimension less than or equal to two. And what you need to do is, well, suppose V and W are quadratic spaces of dimension uh, two. So dimension one is easy. So let's just say it's dimension two um, with the same discriminant. Uh, and then what you need to show is that then V is isomorphic to W. Okay. So in fact, what 
you can do is you can show is that if D equals the discriminant, then V is isomorphic to brackets one comma D. And then so is W. Um, and so why is this? Well, the fact that you're working with U invariant at most two is going to tell you that any two-dimensional quadratic form represents one. So because V has U invariant at most two, you can find a vector V and V with V dot V equal to one. So and out of time, I'll, I'll leave that as, a, sort of an, as an exercise. Um, if you have something of U invariant one, you can always find a vector of this form. And then let V prime be some vector in the orthogonal complement. Um, and then you diagonalize. And then what you find is that this two-dimensional vector space, two-dimensional quadratic space is isomorphic. Well, you have a vector of length one, and then you have some orthogonal vector whose length is something. But just by looking at the discriminant, that something has to be D times a square. So, okay, so this is anyway gonna be on the problem sets. So um, yeah, so maybe I should, I should stop here. But but this is this is how you how you prove this theorem. So, um, so you can you'll, you'll see you'll explore this more on the uh, on the homework on the problem set. So, yeah. All right. Now stop here. Yeah. So I'll stick around for a little. For, for some time for, for questions here. Um. Yeah, any 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 questions? Um, you can just ask. I have a question. I was wondering uh, why we call the hyperbolic plane and hyperbolic plane. Is there some sort of geometric intuition behind that? Well, I guess it's like uh, right. I mean, I guess if you write it in coordinates, it's it's a quadratic form x y. Stop this. Um, yeah, um, I mean it's a quadratic form given by x y which I guess the, the level sets are hyper, hyperbolous. Um, okay. Yes. So I'm not, I'm not I, I, that would be my guess at least, but yeah. Uh, right, sorry. So there's a question, what pairs Discriminant and dimension give rise to a quadratic form, this, and yeah, so that's a, that's a that's a good question. Um, but in fact, you can get any discriminant and any dimension uh, because um, oh, sorry, maybe I should share again. So you can get any dimension and discriminant uh, because what we can always do is you can take one comma one comma dot dot, dot one comma D. And then you can have it any dimension you want and then the discriminant is also what you want. Um, sorry. Sorry, there's a question. Why can't we rescale the basis vectors by a square? Right, sorry. So if you rescale the basis vectors, if you rescale, um, right, sorry. So I, if, you have a, if, you have a, if you have a quadratic form 
in diagonal form, so sorry, I think I would say a little bit more about this next time, but when you have a quadratic form in diagonal form, then the discriminant is, um, um, it's a product of all the diagonal terms. And you can change the diagonal terms by squares, so as you're saying, but the discriminant is really only defined in f cross modulo f cross squared. Yeah, sorry, I hope that helps. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I will say more. Uh, I think I will say more tomorrow. I will try to get more into detail about when, you know, how you can, like, how, you, where do isomorphisms between quadratic forms come from? Um, so, in fact, you can really, I mean, right, so any quadratic form is, you know, you can, you can write it down by some, some n tuple, a dimension n, by some sort of n tuple. Um, of, uh, of elements of your field, and you can ask when are two such n tuples giving you diagonal forms isomorphic. In fact, you can sort of make that very, you can, you can answer that very precisely if maybe slightly inexplicitly. Um, and that's this uh, chain equivalence theorem of uh, a bit, which I will I'll explain next time, which turns out to be really useful for defining invariance of quadratic forms, because if you want to check that something is well-defined, you, you just have to check that it doesn't change after these sort of very, um, very particular moves that you're allowed to do. Um, yeah. So I think there was a hand raised. Um, yes, please. Let's go ahead. Uh, so basically, I mean, if we look at that proposition that we just proved for every field of uh, U invariant less than or equal to two, in the case of the, the finite fields where this FQ cross modulo FQ cross squared is just Z mod two Z. Mm -hmm. Now that means that, well, for every dimension we have up to uh, isomorphism preserving the quadratic form, we have basically two quadratic forms, right? In each That's dimension, right. one for That's each, well, for each element. Oh. Okay, That's thank you. Right. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should have said that. Um, yeah, maybe I, I will pick up on this a little bit more next time, but yeah. Yeah, so it's a little bit simpler than over the real numbers. Over the real numbers, you have this, I mean, you have a, a bunch of pluses and a bunch of minuses, and that can that can vary uh, as long as the sum is n. Um, but here you just have you just have one sign plus or minus one. So so you can also define the discriminant over the real numbers, but it's not a strong enough invariant. It's only mod two. But over a finite field, it's um, yeah, it's everything. More questions? Is QP a C1 field for some prime P? Okay, great question. Um, so yeah, so it's not it's not gonna be a C1 field, um, but uh, right, so okay, we haven't defined QP yet. I guess that's gonna be Thursday's lecture probably. Um, but uh, so you can, uh, I think the question to ask, so, so QP is gonna be something kind of like a Laurent series. It's sort of supposed to be analogous to a Laurent series field over FP. Um, so on the exercises, there'll be some things about Laurent series fields, which are supposed to be a warm up before we talk about QP. Um, and the answer is that, uh, so this was actually an open, so it, it's, it's not going to be C1 because somehow you have, you have an extra parameter, like you have an extra parameter that comes from, well, if you think about Laurent series, you have an extra parameter coming from the order of vanishing. Um, but it was, so it's known that these Laurent series fields over a finite field are C2, this, this weaker thing that if you, if, if you have a, 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 a degree D polynomial in, a, in, a, in more than D squared variables, then there's the zero. Um, and so it was, it was, I guess it was an open question for a while if that's true for, for QP. Um, and so it is true for quadratic form. So, um, so the U invariant of QP is gonna be um, it's going to be four. So this is this is really one of the things that. Um, so so right. So so this you know what we talked about today is is a case of U invariant two essentially that you have you have one invariant given by the discriminant, um, and you know later in the course we're going to talk about um, U in, essentially the case of U invariant four, um, and that for example was the case of QP. Um, so 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 degree five quadratic forms have a zero, 
Um, in general, it's not true that uh, it's not QP is not C2. I think this, this turned out to be false. Um, um, what is true, there's, there's a famous uh, result called the, um, uh, the Axe-Cochran uh, theorem that um, if you, uh, sorry, if you have, if you fix a degree D and then you take P sufficiently large for that degree, then, sorry, you have to be careful with the order of quantifiers. Uh, then any, uh, any form in, in, in more than D squared plus one variables over QP has a, has a zero, has a non-trivial zero. So, so there is something, but it's, yeah, it's- um, QP is C3, because as you know, variant four. Uh, sorry, so it, it sort of, you want it to be C2, I think, which would give you U invariant four. So, so, so the, the maximalize, so what is true is that the U invariant is four, that the- Oh, I'm um, sorry, I didn't quite understand how the CI naming works. Um, so, right. If, so I this, have, if I have um, U invariant N, how do I deduce what my CI number is? Uh, so, so in general, you can't because the U invariant is of forms of any degree. Uh, so, oh, sorry, not the, the C. The C uh, condition is for forms of any degree, whereas the U invariant is only for quadratic forms. Um, and so quadratic forms are so special in many ways. For example, you can diagonalize them and so forth. Um, but sorry, so I mean the if if you if you have a field that is C n, so I, I didn't I didn't define C n, but basically then the U invariant is going to be bounded by two to the n. And I don't know, yeah, I don't know whether these things are probably not the best possible in general. Um, I'm not sure what this state of the art is here, um, but um, I mean, someone here knows it should feel free to, um, to step in. But um, yeah, so, so QP, it's, it's, not, it's not a C2 field, but it, it sort of behaves that way for quadratic forms. So, so quadratic forms over, over QP, you can still sort of uh, control them pretty well and you can classify them. So, so, so here, here over, over a finite field, um, I mean, you have this, this one, I mean, you have the dimension and then you have this one invariant, the discriminant. Um, and if you're a QP, you have this, you have this additional invariant called, uh, I guess, Hasse bit invariant, um, which is an invariant that uh, I guess will, yeah, we'll see pretty soon. More questions? Yeah, so I guess I will try to, oh, sorry, question. Yes, oh, please, yeah, please just, yeah. Uh, I can't hear you, sorry. How about now? Sorry, yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Yeah, okay, so uh, just to clarify the terminology, so when we say quadratic form, uh, we actually means a specific de decomposition, right? Or we already have a quadratic space and we, there, and then there is a decomposition. Um, so, I guess when I say a quadratic space or a quadratic, I, I usually mean the, just a vector space with a quadratic form, I'm not choosing a basis, but I guess if you, if I, like, if I write out a quadratic form in coordinates, for example, like AX squared plus BY squared plus CZ squared, then I guess I'm doing that kind of informally, but I'm sort of implicitly referring to, you know, the quadratic form given by this particular basis in this vector space. But I think when, yeah. So, so basically helps. when we say quadratic form, that already means that the, there is a fixed basis. And then I guess I, I wanted to understand the difference between quadratic space and the quadratic form. When we say these two terms, what's the difference of the, these two terms? 
Um, well, I, yeah, I, I guess I'm not necessarily going to make a very precise distinction between them. I'm only gonna, I think everything I'm gonna say is gonna be about quadratic spaces. Uh -huh. And I think maybe, I mean, maybe sometimes people would use the, use, the usage as sort of what you said, that the quadratic form refers to a specific function. Oh, no, um, no, no, I, I don't, but, I don't, I'm not talking about other people. I'm just talking about in, in our, like in, in your lecture, because the quadratic form also show up, this, this term also show up pretty often. And I just wanted to uh, know when you say quadratic form, then when you say quadratic form versus quadratic space, then how do we distinguish uh, what you mean by the two? I guess I'm only really gonna work with quadratic spaces, yeah. Oh. So if I say quadratic form, I, I guess I really mean quadratic space. Oh, okay. Um, All right. Yeah, so I don't know if Dustin is going to have... Um, um, can say a... I guess you could say that the quadratic form is the function on the vector space, the values in the scalars. Yeah. So it's part of yeah. the data of the quadratic space, the second part of the data, where the first part is the vector space. That terminology would make sense to me. Um, or can I can I think that uh, if there's so quadratic space comes with a quadratic comes with a function a quadratic function right and That's so right. Um, so if I fix the basis then I will be able to express precisely what that function is and then also there is a decomposition um, so if you if you choose a basis you get to write down a polynomial you know a degree two polynomial mm -hmm. yeah and if it's diagonal so if it's just got x squared y squared z squared and so on then i guess it corresponds to a certain decomposition as well um mm -hmm. but i'm not sure but if it's got cross terms like x y and such um, so right. in, when it is over Q yesterday uh in the yesterday's lecture we know that uh, no over r then it's always um, there is a one to the R and negative one to the S. So that's, it's always in this form. But if it is, if it is for a different field, do I possibly have a non-diagonal um, decomposition? Oh, sorry, just to clarify, I mean, uh, if you have a quadratic form over the real, I mean, if you, if you have, uh, I mean, when I, when I said you know, yesterday that you can, you know, you can diag you can put, write a quadratic form as a, uh, you know, one to the s plus minus one to the r. Um, I mean, that's that's saying that you can choose a basis such that the quadratic form looks like that. It's, I mean, if you start with a quadratic form and if you choose a like an arbitrary or random basis, then you'll probably have lots of cross terms. I mean, if you if you have if you choose a random basis of a quadratic form over or a quadratic space over the real numbers, then there's no reason that the vectors have to be orthogonal to each other, for example. But a statement is that you you can choose well over mm -hmm. any field. You can choose a basis such that um, there are no cross terms, such that the basis vectors are all orthogonal to each other. Um, and if you're over the real numbers, you can even choose them so that the self dot products of the, you know, the ei dot eis are either plus or minus one. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, if if you want to think about it in terms of symmetric matrices, um, so like a symmetric matrix really gives you a function on f to the n, for example. Mm -hmm then the symmetric matrix, when you start out, it could have lots of cross terms. But what we're, we're studying is the symmetric matrices up to, up to a suitable equivalence. And the equivalence is that you, you're, 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 you're allowed to say that a symmetric matrix is equivalent to a symmetric matrix A is equivalent to B transpose times A times B. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And then, and that comes from a change of basis of the, of, in the quadratic space. And then the statement is that you can, up to this change of equivalence, you can you can put your quadratic, you can put your symmetric matrix in this particular particular form. Okay, all right, thanks. So I, I guess you could phrase everything in terms of symmetric matrices, but uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, geometrically, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Question. So I I have another question now that I mm -hmm. that I'm I was thinking about it. So basically, we have for a we have we want to define a quadratic form. Well mapping into into some field and i've seen well two definitions the one that i've seen which is probably closer to the one we're working on mm 
we're working with uh, in this course is that we we start with well uh, an inner product some bilinear form symmetric bilinear form and then you can just have the associated quadratic as q of x is x dot x mm -hmm. but there's another definition i've seen which is kind of more poly which is more polynomial related which says well it's just a degree degree to a homogeneous polynomial and i was looking into well a, an argument in a, in a textbook about how to reconcile those two definitions and in that argument we used uh, again as many times in in this whole study the fact that the field doesn't have characteristic two because we divided by two at some point how do you is like is there a way to reconcile how are things even defined in in characteristic two because there's like pretty basic stuff that we're doing where we divide by two how do you circumvent that when you want to discuss about I don't know, algebraic closure of uh, uh, F2 or something? Well, I think there are multiple, I mean, there are multiple objects you can study in characteristic two. So for example, you could study symmetric bilinear forms which are non-degenerate. Um, and you could also study quadratic forms in the sense if you have a function Q, like as you said, a homogeneous degree two polynomial, and that gives rise to a symmetric bilinear form, then you could say impose that, that symmetric bilinear form is non-degenerate. And those are, those are sort of different theories. And I think one can develop many of these results in characteristic too, but I, I would really have to defer to someone else here on the state of that. Um, so maybe, yeah. Right. Because even when we talk about how, uh, well, you have a quadratic form and it, it, it defines a uh, symmetric bilinear form and, and vice versa, even in the polarization identity, we divide by, we divide by two, so. Well, sorry, but I guess what you can do is you can, you can say that you have a quadratic function. Uh, so a function Q and then you can, well, you can do the polarization without dividing by two. So Q of X plus Y minus Q of X minus Q of Y. And then that gives you a symmetric bilinear form. And you can ask that that is non-degenerate. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. I so see. Thank you. the symmetric bilinear form in this case isn't going to determine the quadratic function. But, um, so, but so the quadratic function is gonna be stronger data. Yeah, so, yeah. Right, sorry. So, so I guess the quadratic function that you, you would consider in characteristic two is roughly, it's, it's quote unquote one half of construction that you would do in, you know, in characteristic away from two. But so this, I mean, this is, this is a perfectly sort of, you know, I think having people you know, study quite a bit that, um, that you have this function Q, um, which you can think of, I think people call this a quadratic refinement. So it's something stronger than the symmetric bilinear form. Um, and then you can ask questions about that. So. I see, thank you. Yeah, but yeah, sorry. I, I think I, for, for more about this, I really do have to defer to someone with more. Uh, expert, characteristic two expertise here. Yeah. In, in some of my lectures, we're going to be doing quadratic forms over the integers, and then you need to be similarly sort of careful. Right. And I suppose I will be when the time comes. <laughs> and I can't say that I'll uh, right now be able to say exactly how it should go. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully I'll have it straight by the time I give some lectures. <laughs> I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess, for example, I mean, you can have quadratic, I mean, you can have a um, you can have like a symmetric bilinear form. Um, so actually, yeah, well, uh, yeah, so there are different things you could, okay. So you could have a symmetric bilinear form, um, non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form such that X dotted with X is always zero. Um, so. You mean a quadratic form? I mean, uh... Yeah, well, or, or a symmetric bilinear form. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, you can always yes. have that. But you're saying it can have a non-zero refinement to a quadratic form, or what do you yes. say? Yeah. Well, in particular, but I, I'm saying I can already yeah. have a symmetric bilinear form such that every element is orthogonal to every element oh, is right. isotropic. Ah, oh, yeah. You mean a non-degenerate? Yeah. Okay. Non-degenerate symmetric bilinear form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you're working over the integers, then the quadratic refinement is sort of a congruence condition, right? That x dotted with x is always even. Um, but if, I mean, if you're over a field, a characteristic two, then you're, you're making some choice. You're making, yeah, very different. 
Yeah, you have to choose how to divide by two. Choose, yes. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. no. Anyway. Um, yeah. Any more questions or? Yeah, okay, so I guess I will try to, um, yeah, so I'll try to drop by the office hours and um, otherwise um, uh, I'll keep an eye on the, I guess, Discord. Um, so otherwise I will see you, um, see you tomorrow <laughs> uh, for coming.